Let's talk about pulse oximeters. Lately, these nifty little devices have gotten a lot of attention due to COVID-19. How do they work? Are they accurate? And should you get one as an OT? Watch this video to find out. Hi, my name is Jeff and I am an occupational therapist. I make occupational therapy content on my blog, otdude.com, social media, podcast, and regularly here on YouTube. If you're interested in learning about occupational therapy, be sure to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss a single video. Also, check out my free resources in the description below. Let's get functional. I have been using pulse oximeters for many, many years now, ever since I was an EMT. First of all, let's go over how they work. We all know how oxygen is important for human life forms, like you and me. We inhale oxygen through the air, which contains about 21% oxygen and 78% nitrogen. Interestingly, hyperbaric oxygen chambers provide oxygen at 100% to the patients inside them. Oxygen enters our lungs and then our blood via the cardiopulmonary system. So this includes the distal extremities, such as our fingertips. Blood helps carry oxygen throughout our body. The main way oxygen is carried is via hemoglobin molecules. A hemoglobin molecule can either bind to an oxygen, also called an oxygenated hemoglobin molecule, or not be bound to an oxygen molecule, also called deoxygenated hemoglobin. Hemoglobin actually contains four binding sites each for oxygen and exhibits what is called positive cooperativity. This means if one oxygen is bound to one of the four sites of a hemoglobin, additional oxygen molecules are more likely to bind to the remaining three sites of the same hemoglobin molecule with higher affinity. This comes in handy when you are in situations that requires you to rapidly take in more oxygen, such as sports or lifting weights. So what does the term oxygen saturation mean? If you take a sample of hemoglobin molecules, say what the pulse oximeter sees on your fingernail, the percentage of hemoglobin molecules that are bound to oxygen is the oxygen saturation. So if all the hemoglobin molecules are bound to oxygen molecules collectively, you will get an oxygen saturation of 100%. It's just simple math. So how does a pulse oximeter determine the oxygen saturation from being just clipped on the finger, earlobe, or other body part? As you may have noticed, there is a red light that shines when you look at a pulse oximeter. The red LED light has the wavelength of 660 nanometers. On one end of the pulse oximeter, there is an LED emitting red light. Directly opposite to that, on the other side of the clamp, there is a detector made to read the light that was emitted. Did you know that pulse oximeters actually contain two lights to function? You cannot see the second LED light with your naked eye because it is infrared light and on the 940 nanometer spectrum. There is also a detector for the infrared light opposite to that light as well. An easy way to understand how these two red and infrared lights work together is that they have an inverse relationship of how they absorb or pass light through relative to whether hemoglobin is oxygenated or not. In other words, they have inverse effects. When oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, more red light passes through the molecules and is detected by the detector. However, at the same time, less infrared light passes through to the detector in this instance. The opposite also happens. When there is less or no oxygen bound to hemoglobin, less red light passes through and more infrared light passes through. By nature of how these two lights have an inverse or opposite relationship to each other when passing through the same hemoglobin molecule, it allows you to demonstrate a phenomenon such as oxygen saturation using basically a mathematical equation. I'm not going to go into the details of the technicals of how pulse oxes calculate oxygen saturation because I do not fully understand it myself. Let's get to the more exciting part, occupational therapy clinical practice. When do OTs see and use pulse oximeters? In my experience, in acute care and inpatient rehab, it's literally every day and everywhere. All the vitals machines have one, whether they are broken or not is a different story as they can be very fragile, especially the stress point of where the cord meets the device. I carry one around in my pocket because it can quickly measure O2 saturation, but also heart rate before, during, and after exertion without having to find a vitals machine. A note on personal pulse oximeters though. The vitals machines with pulse oximeters connected to them that you see in the hospitals and clinics cost hundreds if not thousands of dollars. 
They are made to be reliable and are calibrated to be more accurate. The pulse oximeters you buy such as on Amazon are much cheaper and may or may not be calibrated and likely to be less accurate, but they can tell the big picture based on high or low readings relative to the same patient. So follow your facility's guidelines about whether you can actually document readings from say your personal pulse oximeter, which is not calibrated because there is probably legal implications from that too. It is like buying a cheap bathroom scale compared to a more expensive medical grade one and using the cheap scale to document your patient's weight. Which one would you trust, right? And as you're documenting vitals, which should become a part of the patient's chart and medical record, you should keep this in mind. That's not to say you should avoid using personal, cheaper pulse oximeters altogether in clinical practice. They can be a very valuable tool, especially for OTs, compared to having nothing instead. So here are some other tips. You can use it as a tool to provide insight into the patient's presentation combined with their, say, chief complaint, nonverbal signs, symptoms, and so on. You can always document other findings besides O2 sat from your personal device, for example. If you suspect your pulse oximeter is getting inaccurate or was never really accurate, put it on yourself and see if you get a reading close to 100. Then hold your breath. And should it drop a little bit? It should. Remember to breathe afterwards. Take your own manual heart rate at the same time. You have a pulse oximeter and see if that's also accurate as well. If you have some time to mess around at work, compare the pulse oximeter that is calibrated from the vitals machine to the one that you have yourself and see if the numbers correlate to each other and see if they're way off. And that can kind of tell you if it's accurate or not too. I wanna go over some points about inaccuracies in general in pulse oximeters, no matter medical, personal, whatever, that I learned way back when I was an EMT. First, while they are wonderful little devices, they are not necessarily always correct. That's not to say you shouldn't trust the reading, but always, always, always listen to the patient's chief complaint and other factors using your professional reasoning. For example, if a patient is reading from a post -oc, say 100%, regardless if it is expensive or not, but they are complaining of shortness of breath, don't dismiss their chief complaint. How about the opposite? A patient's reading is low, say in the 80s, but they are saying they are breathing fine. I would then keep an eye on this patient and trust the pulse oximeter more. It is better to err on the side of caution in any case than to compromise a patient's safety. Second, some factors can affect pulse ox readings. For example, a patient with carbon monoxide poisoning will have incorrect, likely a higher oxygen saturation reading than actually is because of how carbon monoxide molecules have a higher affinity to bind to hemoglobin than oxygen does. Thus, a reading with a carbon monoxide patient poisoning, such as with smoke inhalation from a fire, will present with, say, 100%, but they may actually be hypoxic. This is because of how the pulse oximeters work. They can't really differentiate to what is bound to hemoglobin, only how much of them are bound or not bound based on the light going through it. Interesting, isn't it? Third, as pulse oximeters use red and infrared light to detect oxygen saturation, being outside, say in bright light or even inside with a lot of artificial light sources can interfere with the equipment. Sunlight contains a wide, broad spectrum of light, including infrared, that can interfere with the pulse oximeters' tiny little weaker, less powered LED lights and overpower them. Because I like to take my patients outside to say get some fresh air or do some OT outside or practice community mobility in a dynamic and challenging environment, I also like to take their O2 saturations and heart rates outside. What I like to do is I cover their finger and pulse ox with my own hands, kind of like I'm making a tent to minimize the amount of external light reaching the detector. Other things like low battery and colder temperatures are known to interfere with pulse ox readings. Sometimes you may not even get a reading at all. If this happens, well, you can probably try changing the battery first or checking the equipment, but you can also try using, say, other fingers. Ear lobes are also a pretty good spot to take a reading. Nail polish can also interfere with readings since it creates a barrier that the two LEDs will need to pass through and could result in inaccurate readings. Watch for other signs of hypoxia also, such as using accessory muscles, tripoding posture, cyanosis, diaphoresis, lethargy, and confusion. To bring home the point about devices such as these is that they are just one single piece of equipment. OTs should and always should use their professional judgment and reasoning and look at the big picture, you know, top down instead of bottom up all the time. And it's easy to do this because we like to quantify our sessions. 
but try to remember to be top down and think big picture. As we are living in a COVID-19, post-COVID-19 world, I wanted to mention how O2 saturations range. Ideally, your patient would have a 98, 99, 100% O2 saturation. However, with patients who have, say, COPD, the therapeutic ranges are actually much lower, 88, say, to 92%. I don't have too much experience to speak to it in working with patients who have had COVID-19, but I have heard from other allied health professionals seeing some really, really crazy low numbers such as 50s, 40s, 30% O2 saturation. At this point, how accurate are the readings compared to, say, 70 to 90s? I don't know, but it's pretty telling of how horrible SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 is to humans. If you are a non-professional or even a professional watching this, especially as an OT, it is a good idea to purchase one. I had a family member contract COVID-19 and lumped them my pulse oximeter, and it not only gave them some reassurance, but it helped them give additional insurance of when or whether or not they should go to the hospital. All in this video with a very powerful story. A patient who contracted COVID-19 was in the ICU for I forget how long, but probably weeks and weeks before I worked with them. But what the patient told me was that his wife purchased the pulse oximeter when he began to develop symptoms and tested positive for COVID-19. One day, his reading was in the low 80s. His wife brought him to the hospital immediately and not long after he was in respiratory distress. Without the pulse oximeter, he likely would have not known and would have lost some valuable time waiting for EMS to come and take him to the hospital or even to provide him oxygen. Just like how important automatic blood pressure machines have become popular and available for pretty much everyone in the home these days, pulse oximeters are the same. They are relatively cheap, but they are just basically in more higher demand than the supply can allow these days. In a post-COVID-19 world, I don't know, maybe everyone should have one of these in their homes too. If you are a COVID-19 survivor, we still don't know the long-term effects on our bodies, so I recommend you get one for you and your family. What type or model doesn't really matter, just get one. So stay safe out there and thanks for watching. Like and subscribe to this channel if you like this OT content. See you in the next one.